Welcome back, everyone, to the 0K April 1v1 2020 tournament. Or April 2020 1v1 tournament. It's April of the year of our Lord 1v1. And I'm joined by Google Frog for the tiebreaker matches. Hi, Google Frog. How's it going? Hello. How was your okay. playing in the tournament? Uh, it started off okay, but went a bit downhill at the end. Well, that is... That is a thing that happens. So... We're not the most sympathetic, I'm sorry, but I'm not quite sure what to say. Anyway, we are going to be doing the some tie breaks. The opponents did get better. Hmm? The opponents did get better. Yep. As well. That's, that is a thing. Anyway, we're going to be... Has this been screwed up this entire time? You've got to be kidding me. Alright, anyway, the... So yeah, with this, we are going to be having a... a third place tiebreaker because our third place was tied four way four way so we actually have a third place tiebreaker bracket which we don't have any image for but whatever so yeah, first mini tournament really yeah basically for third place so first off we have Kshatria versus Izrad there is in parallel Diamond versus Dabakep but I picked one so the winner of this fights the winner of Dying Fire and Dabakep, and then whoever wins that gets third place, because Randy got first, Manny got second. I think you were, like, s tied for seventh, weren't you, Google Frog? Possibly. It's, um, the way it works. Swiss, you know, you get ties. We're lucky to not have a tie for first and second, even. Yeah, like I said during the last match, if Dying Fire had won, we would have had a three-way tie for all. It would have had to basically turn it into a, a bracket for any place at all, because everyone would have been tied at 5-1. Like, the top three spots would have all been tied, and then it would have just been, okay, well, I guess we have to play a bracket out. <laughs> yeah, so we have a nice shield and cloak here. Both players are pushing forward. It does feel like Israel's being a little bit more conservative when it comes to their expansion, though. Like... Yeah, Israel's not going so central. No, going for a bit of raiding in the backyard, not managing to find a whole lot, but does manage to at least get rid of... Uh, it's not really worth... That wasn't really worth much. Good, good scouting, though. I'll grant. Tying up two glaives for a bit of time is okay. That's a fair point. Yeah, that does open things up a bit for the expansions. Although, that, that being said... there, possibly because of the bandit, was scouted. Uh, that's true. I feel like that would have been Maybe a matter of course, though. Bottom. Sending a conjurer to the bottom. Oh, yeah, might nice. Happen, though. Well, it looks like Izzerite has somewhat wise to the possibility of that, or at least is scouting out possible expansions, but does miss it. If they hadn't moved the bandits, they might have spotted it. Going instead for their own sneaky along the bottom, though, and I think Kshatriya might not have spotted this, though. Kshatriya's radar... Their commander should have spotted on radar. Yeah, it did. So Kshatriya's yeah, well aware. Yeah, it's coming. He's not really responding to it, but he... Oh, no, he sent two glaives back. Well, I did the job for Izzerite. Forcing the retreat, at the very least, is going to be able to open that up. And that is Kshatra with even more on the defensive. So despite the fact that Izzerite is much more conservative expanding, Kshatra is behind when it comes to their economy. Yeah, he's put down an early caretaker and has to put down another lotus as well. Just to be safe. Yeah, all well, at the same time losing a couple glaives on the raids, so Kshatriya is really hurting now. I mean, that sneaky expansion is kind of helping, but the problem is the mainline expansions are not happening, where Izzerite is taking all of them, and now the glaive's going down as well. That's an oh. okay trade. Keeps the bandits away from his stuff. That's true. Ties with the bandits. Well, at the same time, though, speaking of, ooh, bandits over to the south. Well, not going to go for it, and I respect that. Absolutely not a safe thing. It's a bit weird, though. He's drawing the bandits towards a sneaky expansion. I think he just realized that and decided to turn around the glaives and fight to the death rather than give out the information. I I mean, I can see why they do that. That was kind of the obvious retreat path. It's just, yeah. Sneaky expansion. Yeah, and now the expansion is safe. It's going to be interesting... Because that expansion is 
I mean, the problem, of course, is that it's, there's a minute delay in the stream, so I don't know if he's first watching the stream, but that, like, that's the one situation where even a minute, even two minutes delay would not be enough. But I guess it's, it has yeah, Lotus's up there. Really? Yeah. Well, uh, at it's any rate... perfectly timed outlaw now. Uh, two, time, two outlaws, actually. Yeah, so Looks is like right... building up a shield ball. What do they have? They have outlaws, they have rogues. Where are the thugs? There are the thugs. So yeah, I think you're onto something there. Although, outlaws got nerfed a bit recently, right? No, not by much. Yeah, but they're still quite good, especially against raiders. Uh, well, at any rate, we'll see how good they are against lotuses, because that hidden expansion is going to be found regardless. Fan is just half to be going that way. Ooh, at the same time... Size over to the north, not managing to do all that much. Scouts on an expansion, but at the same time, gonna lose the information war. And Kshatra, on top of losing the center of expansions, that hidden expansion takes some damage. Will not go down, but it has been spotted. Israel knows exactly what they can do now. Yeah, he went in a bit piecemeal. That that outlaw can't walk in against two turrets. No, but I mean, it wasn't known, right? I mean, granted, I would have. It would have been better to have the bandits along with the outlaw to begin with, like make sure that their speeds were matched. Yeah. And the economy's become a bit... Uh, oh, no, it's sort of swinging back. Still somewhat it, even. Israel has the advantage, but Kshatra is rebuilding their metal extractors, getting some reclaim going. Or no, not reclaim, sorry, overdrive going. So it's really not something you can say is that lopsided either way. It is, it is fairly even. Though with this southern expansion being destroyed, I and Israel, oh that bandit does go or that convict rather does go down, so it's not going to be rebuilt anytime soon. Big. That is huge. That is huge. No reclaim, no take, no taking this expansion when it's destroyed. So Kshatra, they're going to lose the southern expansion, but they're not going to have to worry about it being taken away from them. Their conjurer is also right here, so as soon as Israel's forces decide it's not worth hanging around here, that conjurer can just go back and rebuild everything and reclaim everything. An attack happy on the north. That's a fair number of bandits. Ooh, that's a dead commander. Well, yeah, no, it's not a dead commander. They're gonna jump out of the way. Yeah, that's exactly what it looks like they're gonna do. That is a threatened commander. And then jump away. Oh, oh is a ride. Nice, nicely done. Shatter's commander goes down. Oh, so no he's... jump. I guess it wasn't gonna be that useful. Yeah, I mean, it would have avoided the bandits. Would have avoided it, yeah. And they could have walked along the other side. It would have at least given them the opportunity to get into the shadow of the lotus. Or I think from there I could have jumped over the cliff, in fact. Yeah, there was enough range to jump over the cliff cleanly. Chat, Chat she has had just issues all game trying to find a spot to push in with his heavy glaive strategy. His rids always had a few turrets just where he needs them. And that's the thing, is those turrets are... They're not quite enough, though, right? Like... It's... It, Kshatra has them, but Israel is going... They, Israel is saying, you know, I just need to have a few more bandits. And then they end up overwhelming because the bandits are able to just not die. And there you go, value. Oh, the conjurer on the south was actually found by the outlaw. Oh. Found and killed. That is a shame. Kshatra is now not going to be able to rebuild that. Well, that's opened up. Israel already received going for it with an army of convicts. They have a chain gang going south to take that for themselves. A few glazers around the batch try to out harass, but I think Israel has radar of this. And yeah, Kshatra yeah, realizes there's no way back. Found. And that is that. Israel is knocked out. Kshatra moves on to continue the fight for third place. And I believe at this point that Davikip and Dimefreund might still be going. Yes, it is. Only six minutes, we can see. That was a pretty quick game. Yep. Yeah, let's pop over there. See what's going on with Davikip and Dimefreund. Huh. That was a weird match. We more often see rovers or tanks. That's, yeah, I actually honestly hovercraft I would have expected, especially nah, coming I think out of Israel. Too small. 
Oh yeah, go for the on. players. So the map is a little small, and there's um, ramps that hovercraft really don't like. How is that different from tanks, though? I think hovercraft are a bit slower on ramps. Oh, okay. You, you think? But, yeah, generally faster. <laughs> it probably still exists. Okay, because I'm thinking, like, you're, you, if anyone would know, it would be you. There are a lot of mechanics. Fair enough. So anyway, what do we have here. You in? Yeah, we're in Cloaky versus Hovercraft. Dime friend going for the Hovercraft, and that. Okay, Israel wasn't so sure about Dime friend. Absolutely, Hovercraft makes perfect sense. I'm watching some of their streams, so yeah, I know they are quite fond of the Hovercraft. Grind you the stream. Mind you, the streams have also been on Thornford, so that's a Hovercraft map. Yeah, Maybe that's why Hovercraft is meta. Maps. <laughs> Maybe that's why it's These meta is because the ladders there. And, oh yeah, those bulls have got this. There's no way that, that commander the doesn't have the firepower. Quite a bit. I mean, I was saying earlier well, that, that I think. 900 in raiders, so you would expect it. Yeah, and I was, so like bulls what, are basically glaives. heavy raiders, right? That army was 15 glaives, right? Over to where? Oh no, the the number of bolas used there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Was a lot of glaives worth. Absolutely. But I was saying bolas, they are basically heavy raiders, right? That yeah. seems to be... Because like, looking at the stats, that's all I can think of for roll for them. They're sort of like a slow damage blitz that is a bit lighter. Okay. And which is an alpha because having two alpha units in the same factory would be a bit, a bit boring. Yeah, especially since dagger is so distinctly alpha. Yeah. And that's his entire thing. I was even saying earlier that I think Dagger is like the only raider that follows Lanchester Square Law because it's high alpha and low reload time means that it doesn't have to move. Oh, oops. Sorry, guys. Anyway, it's alpha and low reload time means it doesn't have to worry about getting in the way of each other because it's not consistent fire. It just shoots when it can, so it scales up really fast on top of line splash. Yeah. So he's trying one last push with the knights. It's already been pre-counted with map control and having a much larger army. Yeah, and that's the thing is, I mean, no reason not to try for it, but knights really do not do well against this. Many. I mean, daggers. Just trying to deal with the numbers is not and not really a thing you can do. The I mean, knights have the HP, sure, but it's just not going to work. As we see, I think yeah. four or five daggers died. Because there's no splash damage off the knights. Yeah, four daggers died. One dagger per knight. Not value. That's 350 to, that's 350 to 80. But you got to remember, that was twice as much value in that um, hovercraft army. Yep. Well, actually, 1,700 left, so it would have been like 2,000 compared to 1,500? No, not 1,500. Four knights. 1,400? Yeah, four knights is 1,400 metal. It wasn't oh, quite yeah. double. It was pretty close. They're not actually. quite right, though, as much as they try. I mean, no, they're not riots. They don't have splash damage. They're assault units. Although, admittedly, considering how often Reavers get used as assault units, I can see the confusion. <laughs> Speaking of... Well, that, that's, that was better value. But it's not really enough. Oh, unfortunately, the bull is too far forward. They are going to die. There's nothing they can do. It's just not enough numbers to overwhelm the knights. And the bullets but cannot there are escape. Numbers in reserves. There are, and there are scalpels. Of course, there's also a conjurer yeah. cloaking it. Scalpels don't work so well against the cloak field. Well, they don't. Though the daggers might spot it out. It looks like Dying has a reasonable intuition on where that cloaking will be. And, oh, well, they're going to spot it, that's for sure. Ooh, a miss on that first shot. Opens things up for a complete destruction of Dabakip's forces. There's an attempt to, an attempt by Conjurer to expand over to the south, but that's not happening. And this is it. Dying Throne looks to be pushing in for what might probably be the final push. 
There is a Conjurer here, possible another Cloaked Knight set up, but it didn't look like Diamond Throne even lost any units in that fight. No, they lost two, they lost two daggers. A few daggers. Three daggers, even. Yeah, that's... That was worth it. That was so worth it. So Dime Throne going in for the push. There are some units over outside. A couple Reavers that are going along the outside, but it doesn't matter. Dabakep realizes there's nothing happening for them. Sees the writing on the wall, throws in the towel, and Dime Throne moves on to fight against Kshatriya for the coveted prize of third place. So, was it Kshatriya? Yeah, it was Kshatriya, wasn't it? No. Wait. Oh, yeah, Izzeride. My bad. What am I saying? It was Kshatriya. Yeah. Bleh. Izzeride. I don't know why I was thinking Kshatriya. Kshatriya. I was, we just talked about Kshatriya because they had such issues when it came to the expansion and they got completely stuffed. Indeed. So, yeah, I guess we have to see which map they're playing on. Some kind of... How come I'm saying Firebreak? we weird map systems before where you, like, ban a map. Oh, yeah, the Smash Bros. style. And then a random map is chosen. Mm. I think it's from the other maps in the pool. It is. Those are the options available. But Aquam's pushing for Firebreak, unsurprisingly. And... Dime Phone's pushing for not fire break. Okay. Uh, so the options are fire break, random crags, banana republic, ravaged, mercurial, and wanderlust. Okay, apparently you can't do multi-line text in the chat field still. Good to know. Be faster to type than to try to copy-paste. Yep, I think I'd rather see... Banana Republic can be interesting. Oh. Ravage can be pretty interesting. When you see random crags, you get the added excitement of not even knowing what the map's going to be. Yep. And hopefully by the time we make the next tournament, the Ivan's shader-based solution will make that much faster for texture loading. I saw you guys chatting quite a bit about that after the round, after round two. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't work so well for rejoining. No, it doesn't. And a shader-based solution would just be nice anyway, because it would... Actually, you know it would be kind of cool? Although I realize, I know there's reasons for terraforming to be the way it is, because it makes it clear that it's artificially done. It would be kind of cool if that kind of shader-based approach for random crags could be applied in some capacity to terraforming. Oh, yeah. You... As in, you could make terraforming with it, surely. It would... And it would probably be way faster. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to have a texture map that's like what is terraformed and what isn't, but still. Like, some yeah. kind of, like, a, a map that gets referenced. Seem that hard. Yeah. yeah. Apparently, so, Dine Freund and Izzerid both love playing hovercraft. Oh, and Sonia, really? Okay, I... Might need more water. This is going to be a long game. <laughs> this is going to be a 40-minute game. Oh, they can be quick. I guess no, they can't. Playing it a lot, so it'll be Not an Ansonia. <laughs> Ansonia is never quick. Okay, sometimes it's quick when I play it. Because I try and not play Hovercraft. Right. How often do you win? Yeah, it doesn't win <laughs> when you don't play Hovercraft. But it's exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's also quick when you hit the resign <laughs> button. That doesn't mean that's a good option. I wonder where this is. I don't think it's been made yet. 
No. Oh no, here it is. It started. <laughs> Wait, what? I don't even see what is. It's called one v one. You know, T tiebreak. Oh, T tiebreak. Oh, for crying out loud! It's been going on for a minute. Nobody well, tells me Well, that means nothing. it's started a minute ago. They're probably still um, placing. That's true. That's fine. Oh yeah, I forget that when it says that. That the timer is not how long the game has actually been active for. Yeah. It's how long the game has actually been going in the real world. Yeah, I don't care about RTA. <laughs> care about in-game time. I've been watching a lot of GDQ recently. Like, the vocabulary is in uh, my brain. <laughs> okay, I'm in, and it's only 29 seconds. In-game time? <laughs> yes. All right, cool. And so that's enough time three to seconds see to catch that up. both made hovercraft. Of course they have. Also, yeah, I don't know if you heard me saying it, but oh my goodness, this is so much smoother. I didn't realize the terrain rendering change would be that impactful. Yeah, they did a really good job. Because, like, it just, it's so buttery smooth and I'm zooming in and out. I didn't realize how smooth it wasn't until this update. Mm, they've got us hooked. We won't be able to go back if we find another bug. <laughs> Oh, wait, has there been bugs with the new terrain rendering? No, not that I've seen, but, you know. Okay. Because the old one had happens. some really bad bugs in Onyx Cauldron. Like, if you didn't have the ground detail high enough, you'd end up losing terrain in awkward ways in the middle of Onyx Cauldron. I think Onyx Cauldron just works fine now. Oh, good. Okay. So have you made it in? Yes, I'm in. And everyone seems to be just going actually fairly aggressive, honestly. I mean, Dying Front less so with that back rear expansion. Is a ride straight to the center. Doesn't want to waste time. I don't think either player really wants to waste time. I think both of them just want to get this through because it has been five hours. Could be a quick game if um, Izzera doesn't see those hovercraft. Ooh. Well, three daggers. No, that won't be enough. To? Three daggers won't be enough. Izzera has enough to defend against that. Will definitely hurt though. Ooh. Oh, that quill's dead. It's three cycles and that quill's going to go down. Ah, but it got the radar tower out. It did. It got the radar tower out. It wasn't really well. Oh, no, oh. It didn't. nope. <laughs> it got the radar tower out a bit too close to the edge. The daggers could see it. So yeah, that was a bit of a shame. But he's right. Is still ahead when it comes to economy, and they're not too bad when it comes. To Actually, they are kind of bad when it comes to quill numbers. They have no other quills. Yeah. Okay. Now there's bad. one sitting in those um, wind generators. Oh, there is. It's hard to see. Yep. Sort you're of right. cowering. It's helping build. Which is probably for the best, because Israelite is going to be doing that with 19 or 20 metal and doesn't have any caretakers right now. So I think Israelite uh, will recover. Like a long game. Look at Dynefrone's building a Stardust in the back. Oh, yeah. No. Dynefrone's building this for. A, they're, I think they're expecting a gunship, like a locust raid on the backyard. Yeah, for the halberds that happen in 20 minutes. Or the halberds, yeah, that works too. Well, the Dying Throne bolus. coming in here... Uh, it could be, actually. That's true. And considering Dying Throne going for this Fjord Assault, they might be expecting that Ezeride will do the same. Although Dying Throne already closed off the Fjord with a bunch of tidal plants. Closed off is sort of a well, weird way to put it. Okay, they've tempor they've cr they made a speed bump. On the fjord. I guess it's true. It's not like the hovercraft are going to run aground on the tidal generators and sink. I mean, that would be kind of annoying if that happened. <laughs> but it followed hydrodynamic physics. And ships just got damaged by accidentally scraping the surface. Well, get the juggernaut there and they could get damaged by scraping the tidals. That's true, actually, yeah. I hadn't thought about that. These bolus are really disruptive. Uh, well, that is in their name, yeah. That, that's kind of the point. Well, not the name, sorry, in the description. So they're doing Is their job. They never quite had enough daggers to one-shot one, so they did quite a bit of damage. And that's not going to be the case any longer. Is a ride now with eight daggers all in one group. 
And these three daggers here should be able to get rid of the- there we go, get rid of the metal extractor, but he's a ride! Still holding on, however, they're not really holding on that tightly. Dime throwing with that economic advantage, just because of those backyard expansions. Like, Dime throwing, like you said, Google Frog, is really playing that macro game. They're playing the long game. Yeah, he's just happy that the, either his hovers can't really raid all that well, so he'll poke around, yeah. but mainly make economy. Yeah, and that just means Ezeride's able to get some damage here and there, but that's about it. I think Dime Friends are like, getting more and more confident every time they scout, and they don't see a single metal extractor on the reefs. Because they know, it's like, oh, Ezeride is just not building. I can just run away with my economy. There's nothing Ezeride's going to be able to do in five minutes. Yeah, that said, the economic, the income difference will be made up temporarily by all the wreckage. That's there very temporary, There are dead daggers. So if Israel can actually stabilize, he could um, do okay. Yeah, I mean, they have 800 metal. Actually, oh, okay, you're right. You're, you're, you're on point there. There's 400 metal in one and 200 metal in the other. So we are going to see a fairly strong use of reclaim because that is what's queued up. So Yeah. If Dian Froen gives him the time, which he might, since he does like to make the economy at the moment. Do you reckon that Geo is going to morph immediately? Mm, How long is not, the game going to be? Not with the raider going like this. Although it is underground. Maybe it will. Not, maybe not immediately. No, I don't think immediately. Dian Froen is going to probably build up a few more metal extracts first, because they only have plus 36. And they have 30 metal per second in the factory, so I think they're going to go in for another... Maybe another plus five. Once it gets to somewhere between 45 and 50 income, then I can see Dying Frame morphing. Maybe even a fusion. Also, yeah, maybe. gunship's queued up. Wants oh, to keep the pressure on. Is. Yeah, it's not surprising. We've seen a lot of gunships. A lot of gunship locust swaps this tournament. It's been popular in a lot of exhibition. In a lot of like, the regular matches, too. Oh, there's the morph. Okay, it was early. Good call. I He's playing the macro. Absolutely. Yeah, Raven was nerfed slightly because it was a bit of a wing condition. Right. And oh, that would make sense then, yeah. You have to switch into something. Well, not only that, if Raven's nerfed, then it can't deal with gunships as easily, so you can then use gunships more easily. And also, locusts are... Well, as the name suggests, they are a pest. Yeah, but I still feel like people farms. are sleeping... At... I feel like people are... <laughs> well, all your wind farms, they just chew them all up. I feel like people are sleeping on harpies, though. I, I just... I get that they're not as flashy as locusts. And maybe with the buffs to glaive health, they're not quite as strong. And maybe that's why I'm thinking they're stronger than they are. I just feel like the hit and run potential... Yeah, I, I think harpy will be discovered at some point. It might get a small buff first, but I think it will be discovered. Yeah, because it's not bad. It's just not... It's not a stay there and burn the base down. It's fly around and knock everything out as you go. It's quite good against raiders. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, you used to one-shot glaives. Yeah. Which I was informed earlier today in chat that it no longer one-shots glaives because it deals 200 damage and they have 250 HP. Yeah, but glaives is all there is. That's true. It's the same relationship with... um. With bandits. With bandit. Oh yeah, yeah, there's the Geo. Dying for and quickly accessing energy due to the lack of grid. Well, I imagine they'll be setting up some pylons fairly soon. Or maybe not, actually. Well, Dying for and... They set up pylons. They'll, they'll get it. Probably in about two minutes. If the game lasts that long. Because honestly, Dying for and... Oh, uh -huh. we've missed... Um, Izzarid's got a lot of locusts. Oh yeah, Israel's is going for the same thing. And actually, they've managed to get their economy well, on track too. Both players are about even. Dime Friend's a little more ahead when it comes to their con or their attrition. But economically speaking, Israel and Dime Friend are at a dead heat. Oh, and the top the top rate is well. That's I think yeah, the, the difference between the two players at this point is one has an you know, advanced geo and one has more locusts. Right, and it's kind oh, of a question. As well as this large army. Of Dying Thrones over on the right. Yeah, so it's Dying Thrones. It's actually pretty concerning. Yeah, Dying Thrones Assault Force 
versus Ezerai's ability to use this Raider Force to force that Assault Force to retreat, which I kind of doubt just because of the production capacity. I that reckon the Locusts build a beat that force. At least if they try something. Uh, the Bolas could be an issue for the Locusts. No, never mind. There's just The numbers are too Bolas high. Bolas don't actually have that much DPS, so they really like being against lone targets. Where That's they can, a fair point. Slow damage is most effective. That is a very fair point. I was kind of thinking because the slow damage on top of the scalpels and such would be enough to make the locusts not able to do much before they get torn to pieces, but... Yeah, that was, no. those were very few locusts lost. I, one. Were there any? I think, no, one was. There's one. Yeah, there's one, there's one in the sea. That's about it. Unfortunately, it can't hit this, can it? Because it's underwater. Like the geoplan. No, I mean. can't. You need daggers to go in there. Or a claymore. Yeah, hence the. But he can underwater. definitely scout it, although he just failed to scout it. Ooh, yeah, that was. That's kind of surprising they failed to scout it. I mean, oh, there he is. No, 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 they got it now. They spotted yeah. it now. So he's right, well aware of dying thrones' resource advantage, and it's kind of a shame the dying thrones doesn't have the pylons up yet. They're just now building them, as I said, in two minutes, and that is not in time. Same time, Dime Throwing just chasing out Izurai, but really that was a scouting force. That was all it was. And that's all it needed to be. Izurai's really going all in on um, Locust. No hovercraft for a long time. Yeah. I'm wondering like where they're mistake. planning on working with Dime that. Dime has tridents. Do they have any anti air on the ground? No, they have scalpels. They're not focusing on that. They're focusing on getting a ground force that can counterattack. Well, there's Razor. Razor's pretty solid. Maybe he wants to just oh, run yeah, in no, and I kill meant... all of Dine Freud's yes. base. But Dine Freud has plenty of radar. Likely. That seems unlikely. Well, I mean, it's a try, but yeah, between the Tridents and the Razors, I don't see this happening at all. Mainly because of the Tridents. We're already seeing, like, two bandits and change being taken out for free. Yeah, he switched away from Locust and is switching into sort of a standard mid-game of our army. Oh, uh, yeah, there's the halberds. It wasn't 20 minutes in, Google Frog. It wasn't that long. <laughs> and, yeah, we are seeing a similar switch. Well, scalpels coming in here. Scalpels and lances and a mace for Ezeride. It's not to say the locusts are um, pointless. They could take out that lance, and it would be well worth it. Wait. I wonder what Ezeride... He put a WTF on the gunship plant. Is I wonder if there's a bug they're having with that. Oh. Oh. Is maybe the lance is stuck. Oh yeah, the lance is stuck. That's what's going on. The mace and the the mace kind of trapped the lance in there. Well, there was a tide. There was a wind jet in the way. I don't think it could actually get through. I think the large footprint units were just blocked. That by makes sense. His little base. Like those yeah. caretakers are perfectly placed. That stardust is perfectly placed. It's kind of hard to tell sometimes, because, I mean, you do get the footprint when you're building, but it doesn't always show you for unit pathing. Yeah, it doesn't tell you how big the units are. And it's kind of hard to... I don't know how you do that interface-wise. Ah. Locusts. Burning all the locusts. So Dimefrain doesn't have an air force anymore, apart from Tridents. Yeah, and he didn't lose any locusts. They're all trying to run away, trying to bait them into the Tridents. And even yeah, that's worth it time. just to not have to build AA. Well, that certainly paid off. I mean, these are losing one, ultimately one locust for the price of what was it, like, eight, eight or so, something like that. Of course, now we're getting into the mid-game attrition. Now we're getting into the attrition trench wars in the center of Adansonia, which is the reason this map tends to take a long time. And why I was saying when this game started, this is going to take a while because they both got themselves lances. They do. So something will die. Yep, that's true. It's not going to be a complete stalemate as it often is. And you have the halberds too to break enough, through siege. Izzerid's made more overdrive metal so far than Dying Friend. Oh, yeah. Just because he's Dying... only just made that pylon. Yeah, Dying Friend, like I said before, relies a lot on pylons. And Izzerid not working with that at all, if none. They're just entirely on chains of solars. Which is definitely the reason why they had more overdrive to begin with, though Dying Friend will be catching up, but may not matter. 
I mean, Issa right in the center of the map. They are managing to do quite a bit of damage. This Lance, however, is heavily threatened, but Halbert's coming in to save the day. Should be able to get rid of the scalpels, and they do indeed distract and destroy the scalpels. Locust coming in, though. Locust coming in, and this one scalpel almost about to get the Lance. Does fire off the missiles. Doesn't matter. The Locusts take it out. Bit unfortunate. That Lance, I think, was a couple seconds away from reloading. Still, though, if Daimfreund really wants to get through this, they need to get some flails to get rid of. Like, one or two flails, just to get rid of those... Those... Ah, blanking here. Tridents. Yeah, scare the Tridents away. Although, what he really wants to do with the Locusts is raid the back. Right. I think Daimfreund stopped that. I mean... Razor, Stardust... Yeah, right in the back would be a brave he idea. He would probably spend all of his locusts taking out three mexes, but then he would lose all of his locusts and have a lot of reclaim there. Well, let's see what happens. No locust dead yet. Uh, one land, one lotus, uh, tank, two mexes. Oof, yeah, this ah, is going to be bad. Did. He did. back the raiders actually let the halberds get in and do a lot of damage. That's true, and this lance is going to go down as a result. Actually, this entire firebase is going to go down as a result. That stinger goes down. And only about a third of the locusts died in the process. Like six locusts. Stinger goes down, coming around. The tridents are out of position, so the locusts from Dimefrind are going to be in a bit of a tough fight. Though the razor is still in play. But the mace is up once there again. The These locusts. Flails you want. Hooray! There's the flails. Those Now this locust down. I don't recall asking for precisely five, but that's how many that were built. I guess because you could just easily queue up five. Not a bad uh, number. If two people. die, you should have three. Yeah. Wait, why would three matter? Three's a good number. I guess. I mean, it... they, they can burst down a a locust with three. You can burst down a locust with two, can't Oh, no, you need three. You need it's like 50 health left with two. Ah, being said though, you can easily burst down a locust with three tridents. And that's exactly what Dying Throne is showing. Of course, middle of the map, Israel's definitely got it in terms of the overall damage, but I think Dying Throne's kind of winning the reclaim war. Like, Israel luckily has a stronger base economy. That's the one thing keeping Ooh, he's him going in this. I've spent the last locust on that, perhaps. Ooh, it's gonna Should work! work. Dying Front's commander down. The locusts are pretty much all dead. Yeah, there's one. Oh, that doesn't matter that much. Look at the welders. Dying Front switched oh, yeah. into tanks for emissary and welder just to win the reclaim war. Oof, that is that is clever. Because that was one thing I was talking about. His economy is Israel kind of was winning that, but Dying Front definitely had a stronger position over the eastern side of the map. And now with these welders, as you mentioned, Google Frog. There isn't much that's stopping Dime from, from running away with this game economically. The Maces are certainly giving it their best try, up. though. So doing a pretty, pretty decent job forcing the welders back, but it may not. I don't think it's going to last that long. The emissaries are in mean, uh, here. No lotus, a lot of damage. locusts. Dime frames free to raid with his own. Yeah, and that's exactly what's happening. He's a ride. Not really invested in anti air. They do have. Of Threshers. It's a thing. It, it'll it help, but it's not long range enough for it to actually do any real damage. I mean, the main base is protected at least, and something. He's mostly covered, but yeah, he's going to get picked off and have to spend time and metal re expanding, making a few raises. And not only that, I mean, at the same time, the center's being torn apart, the reclaim is happening. Although I like the fact that Ezerite is doing frontline reclaim because, I mean, they've Kind of have to. The welders are going down, thanks to the halberds, but that's only going to last for so long. Like, take what you can get when you can get it. And wisely moving the quills back once the army is gone. Although, I think this locust... Oh, no, they're going too far. Maces again. Riots. Kill locusts. Do not fight riots with locusts, as Dying Frame clearly knows. I think Izzard's been destabilized by at this point. They have no econ They have no base economy anymore. They lack a bit of economy. They had a plan, but they haven't got a, where to, a position to move to. Dine friends 
escalated to emissaries and to welders and now to a iris. Yeah, and that one e Cyclops. neither emissary died either. Those locusts died for nothing. And he said Google Fraud that Iris coming in there. Oof. Cloaked scalpels, cloaked bulls, cloaked lance. Oh, cloaked lance doesn't last long. But cloaked everything else. Yeah. Dime Throne is looking very scary. And this entire time, this one geo plant, just nothing happened to it. Is there any fusion plants in the base? No, it's literally just that one geo plant powering the pretty much the entire economy for Dime Throne. Their economies are fairly, well, sorry, their energy income is fairly equal. There is Isarite focusing entirely on using fusion and solars with some wind. It's a very different approach. Same result. How it's going to work out, though... I just don't though, think he has an answer to the Cyclops. I don't either. I can't really think... Hovercraft just... I mean, maybe... No, Claymore wouldn't. Would it? Well, Hovercraft does have an answer. You could try and snipe with Lance and send yeah. it back. With Bolas now, if you cloaked Bolas, it would do a lot of slow damage. But I think he just doesn't have the stability to be in a position to counter it. Well, yeah, because it's, it's not just that. Like, yeah, it's... Okay, it's 2,000 metal, so you can get a lot of Bolas for that. Or a lot of anything. If you can actually build it. But he's right at this point, it's half the economy of Dime Throne, and that's not a winning position. Like, it really all just came and down to the fact that... Energy is there is, huh. what, 7,000 metal in the middle that Dime Throne can just have? Yeah, and Dime Throne is taking it rapidly. It feels like Israelite, like, they had a really strong position up until the point where they went for that comp snipe. Honestly, I think the comp snipe Possibly, was a bit of a mistake. Yeah. Like, they lost a the lot of locusts. The was spent pretty well up until then. Exactly. It was very safe. This very cautious use of locusts that were... Dimefrain respected the locusts, and once they were gone, Dimefrain didn't care anymore and just went ham. Because they knew that Ezerite couldn't really raid them in the back, and so Ezerite had to punch through the front lines, which Dimefrain had done a good job securing. Which meant Ezerite had no options other than to throw in the towel, which is exactly what's happened. So with that... So it ends. That's so it ends. And that is that Dimefrain getting third place... In the April 2020 1v1 tournament. Congratulations, Dying Throind. You're number three. <laughs> it is funny. <laughs> it's real, uh, real low stakes for what was you know, two extra rounds, basically. Yeah. The the person who's played the most for the position. You're not wrong. But I had this chance against Manu and um, Randy earlier. Yeah. But I mean, you're not wrong. Well, Dime Throne has been doing a lot both. of playing. I think they had their chance against both. Let me check. Let me check the brackets. Because it looks like... It would make sense for the format. It would. So they fought Randy in round six. And they fought Di... Or did they fight Manu? They fought Manu. I'm sure... Oh, hang on. I can highlight their name. No, I can't highlight their name. What? The... Oh. Uh, no, did not fight Manu. Did not fight Manu. You're right. They so they would have fought Manu in a tiebreaker had it been a three way tie had they won against Randy. If they beat Randy, they would have had a chance to fight Manu probably in order to tiebreak yes. the first place. So having if they beat Randy, they would have had a chance to get first place. Oh yeah, because of the three way tie. Yep, it would have been a three way tie for first. It would have been the entire th like top three would have just been a single limb bracket to finish off. Anyway, yeah, that, that would yeah, that would have been kind of, that would have been a thing. But that is not how it goes. Randy just took it off being undefeated. Manu took it off of being defeated only by Randy, and Dime Throne took it by winning against Isaride and Dabkep, or Dabkep then Isaride, in order to win a single limb bracket in order to get third on their favorite map. So with that, we are done basically. So thank you all for I think watching. We're done thank entirely. you entirely. Yeah, we are. So, thank you all for watching. Thank you, Google Frog, for coming to co-commentate when it comes to the tiebreakers. Or, for the tiebreakers. That's a weird way of phrasing it. Thank you for co-commentating the tiebreakers with me. And thank yeah, you no all problem. for playing and for watching. I really appreciate it. We had... I, we've, this is the most viewers we've had 
for a tournament stream ever. Really? I, by a factor of about three, I think. Normally, it's like oh, wow. 20 or so, 13, like 15 to 20, and we've had solidly 30 to 40 viewers throughout the entire stream. Well, that's about twice as many people as were competing. The tournament was quite large. It was. Yeah, 18 players is also the largest tournament we've had since... I feel like it's the largest tournament we've had in eight years. Like, the last tournament that was anywhere near this big was that ill-fated weekly tournament where it was like every week people would do some matches across a bracket. And it was like 30-something players, but it ended up not actually going anywhere. And that was, I think, 2011 yeah. or 2012. We might have had larger 2v2 tournaments. Right. But then I would count because the number of teams. Half as many teams. Yeah. So it would be hard to, you know, square the bracket in your memory with what that looks like. I think you're right. I think the last two, uh, the largest 2v2 tournament was 22 people, 11 teams. Something like that. Something. It's 10 or 11 teams. But this is the largest 1v1 tournament we've had. To my memory. Yeah, most likely. This Yeah, this would have been crazy to run with um, double elimination. Oh, yeah. Actually, well, it was five hours. Double elimination. If it was best of three winners, best of one losers, as we often did before, then we're looking at an average of an hour per round. And we're looking at log four okay so we're looking at about four or five rounds including grand finals it would have been about the same length mm, that's with an average of an hour per round true there's always one round that blows out true and that's also assuming that lower the lower bracket is best of one not best of three if the lower bracket is best yes. of three then it would have been seven or eight rounds effectively like in terms of time and so it would have been seven or eight hours so you're not wrong when it comes to if the lower bracket was the same number of rounds as upper bracket. But yeah, yes. Swiss also lets people play more, which is great. It's probably one of the reasons we had so many people come in and play, because they could actually play, which is more than you can do in double limb sometimes. Sometimes you just go 0-2. Yeah, the the Swiss style is definitely like a community tournament. More exactly. for the people playing. It lacks yeah. a big hypey grand final, but that's more for viewers. And we got plenty of viewers, so clearly this yeah. format is is appealing. But anyway, that's enough shop talk for today. So again, thank you all for watching, playing. Thank you, Akin, for hosting the tournament. Thank you, Google, for helping co-commentate. And until next time, that is it. So have a good day, everyone, or night, or whatever time of day it is for you. Bye. Bye.